Hi everyone. This is the second lecture for chapter one. So today we're going to learn how to read and brief a court case. So this is gonna be really important because most of the stuff we do throughout the year is going to be, or semester is going to be reading uh, Supreme Court cases. So you want to be able to read them and break them down in um, a way that you're gonna understand what they say and you can create like a short little kind of like notes on the case and understand the case. So I'm gonna share my PowerPoint with you. Now, what we're going to do for this um, uh, lecture is we're going to use the court case Roshan versus California. So it is in your book. You can look it up in the index and find it. Or I attached it as a file um, in the assignment or in the weekly materials. So if you just want to open that document, you can read it that way. But my suggestion is to stop the video and to read the case so that you have an understanding of what it says. And we're gonna use that case as an example throughout the lecture. So you know exactly how to uh, brief the court case. So stop it, read the case, and then come back. So hopefully everybody's read the court case. Now what we're going to do is talk about that case. Before I get started with that though, I wanna talk about the concept of case law, okay? So where does case law come from again? Case law are court decisions. So judges make decisions in cases. There's litigation, something comes up in court that goes to a judge and the judge has to make a decision. The decision that that judge makes becomes what we call case law. It's often called common law also. So common law, case law is judge made law. So in this class, we are going to focus a lot on constitutional law, the Constitution, the 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendment. And then we're going to look at the Supreme Court cases that interpret that. So a lot of what we're going to be looking at in this semester is this case law. So that's what we want to do. I want to read these cases and figure out what they say. So we're going to learn how to brief these cases, okay? So when you read these cases, it's important to be able to pick out the most important details. What do you need to know about this case? So we're going to learn a set method on how to do that. How can we pick out the very specific little things that we need from that case and make a brief little note on that case? And it's exactly what it says. It's brief. It's supposed to be short. It shouldn't be more than a page. It should be just the quick information about that case so you don't have to read it ever again. And you can just go back and look at your notes. And that's what we're going to learn how to do today. Okay, so the actual case brief that we're going to use is a systematic method that's used by and people that read court cases. So if you go to law school, if you're in the paralegal program, whatever program you're in, if you're reading court cases, they use this briefing format. It may vary a slight bit of difference, like just a little stylistically, but the same basic information is going to always be included on these briefs. So you want to learn the style and then you'll always know how to read and pick out the important pieces of a court case. Okay. Now, when we talk about there's certain sections, these are the sections that we're going to put in our case brief. So we're gonna start with the idea of the case citation. We'll talk about that. Then the facts. We're gonna break facts down into procedural and substantive. So we'll talk about what each one of those are. We're gonna talk about the rule or the law that's actually being discussed in the case. In our case, it's mostly gonna be a constitutional amendment. We're gonna talk about the issue or the constitutional question or the question presented sometimes it's called. What are they asking the court to decide? What is the actual issue or question that they're asking the court to decide? Arguments on both sides. So you have the state arguing one side, you have the defense. Remember, we always are an adversarial system. So there's always two arguments. So we need to set forth what those arguments are. The holding or court decision. So when we think about the question that was asked, the issue above, how did the court answer that? And then court reasoning, why? How, why did they make that decision? What were their reasons for it? And then your critical assessment. What do you think about this? What impact does this have on all of society? 
So this is the format we're going to use. So hopefully you read Roshan. We're gonna go through each of these sections so you understand what goes in each section, okay? So we're gonna start with case citation. When you're talking about case citations, you're talking about where to find the case, okay? So just like if you're citing uh, information in a research paper, APA, MLA, whatever format you use to cite information, the case citation is that. It's just a specialized form used legal for legal cases. So where do we want to find this case? What is the information is gonna tell us where to go. If we go to the library, where can we find this case? So in the black, you can see it's written. That's the whole case citation. So Richards versus Jackson, Jackson comma 113, US 938, 1987. That's the case citation. So what the heck does that mean? Well, we can break that case citation down into its individual parts. So whenever you have a court case, it has a name. So names of the parties that are involved in that court case. So if it's criminal, it's usually going to be a state or the federal government against a person. If it's civil, it's just two people's names. So Richards versus Jackson shows it's probably a civil case. It's two people involved in some sort of court action. So the case name is Richards versus Jackson. Now I'm gonna skip the 113 for a second. I'm gonna to go to the US. The US is the book you're going to look at. Okay, so it's just telling you the name of the book. So US means it's in the Supreme Court uh, official reporters, okay? So if you ever see US, you know it's a Supreme Court case. So that's telling you the book to look in. You're looking at for the book that contains the US Supreme Court cases. And it's actually called the US Reporter, okay? Now the 113 is the volume of that book. So when you go to the library, all the US reporters are gonna be on the wall and you're gonna go down and find the book that's labeled 113. That's the volume, okay? Once you take that book off the shelf and you open it, you're gonna open it to page 938 and that's where the case will be. And then the year is just telling you the year that the courts decided that case. So once you break it down into its parts, it's not so complicated. Just telling you how to go to the library and locate this. Now for our sake, I'm gonna mostly give you your citations. You can Google them nowadays, but it's just important to know what the pieces of that citation are. Now, remember we said that the US was the book. So this is just telling you what the books are. So you'll have an understanding. So if you ever see in the book part, US or sub court, you know immediately by looking at that citation that it's a Supreme Court decision. Now, why are there two? Because one is the official one that comes straight from the Supreme Court. These are the opinions as written, just like the Supreme Court justices wrote. So US is the official governmental reporter. But sometimes companies want to create their own books and they take the decisions and they add notes and references and helpful information for the reader. Those would be S court. So it's the same decisions, but they'll have extra helpful information that go along with the decision. So if you see US, you know it's the official reporter. If you see S court, you know that that's the unofficial, but they both have the same decision and they're both Supreme Court. Now, the next level down court is the Court of Appeals, the Appellate Circuit, the Court of Appeals. If you see F or F2D or F3D, you know that those are all Court of Appeals decisions. Now the two and the three are just showing you different volumes. So they ran out of Fs, so then they started over again at one and labeled it F2, okay? So it's another series of books. So if you see F, you know they're really old cases. If they're F3s, then you know they're more modern cases. F sup means a court decision that comes from the district court. So the lowest federal courts. So if it says F sup, you know it's the lowest court in the federal system. Now New York has its own reporters for it. So that's all the federals. We have the state side. If it's the highest court in New York, it's gonna be NY or NY2D. So the New York Court of Appeals is the highest court in the New York state system. Its decisions are all gonna go in those books. They don't have an 
uh, an official one, they just have the official one. Then you have the appellate, the middle court levels in New York State is the appellate division. So that's AD or AD2. And then if it's the lower trial courts in New York State, it's the Supreme Court is the lowest court in the New York State. Those are gonna be mis or miscellaneous, miss or miss two, okay? So when you look at a citation and you see that book, you would immediately know what court decided that case. We are going to use a US and the S court citations the most. Those are the court cases we're mostly gonna use in this class, okay? So just to test your knowledge, if you were looking at these citations, where would you find these cases, okay? So if I asked you for the first one, what's the name of that case? So you're looking at the citation, what's the name of it? The name of the first one would have been Rodriguez versus Roche, okay? So this is the name. And the second one, if I ask you what court it comes from, you look at the book and it's S court, so you know it's Supreme Court. Now, if I wanted to know what volume of the Supreme Court Reporter, then I look at the 93, that's our volume, okay? So the next one, what is the page that that's found on? It's found on page 201, okay? So 201 would be our page. Now, if we look at the book, we see F2D. Now, going back to our previous chart, we know F2D is a court of appeals. So we know it's a court of appeals decision. Now remember the court of appeals has many circuits around the country. So it will also tell you which circuit it is. So second circuit. This one, what year did the judges decide it? 2007. And then this one, what is the court? So again, we see this second. We immediately know, looking at our chart, that that is the lowest court in New York. So it's a New York decision and it's the lowest court, it's miscellaneous, okay? And since it's the Supreme Court, we have one Supreme Court in New York in every single county. So it will also tell you which county it's from. So this one was from Erie County. So hopefully uh, you understand that. There is a practice assessment online. If you're confused with this at all, you can get on and you can take the practice assessment as many times as you want to make sure you understand how citations work. Okay. Now, if you were looking at the Roshan case, look at the case and see if you can write out its citation. So pause this for a second and see if you can write it. Hopefully this is what you wrote, okay? Roshan v. California, comma 342, US 165, and it was 1952, okay? Now, the next area we have to learn how to do is what we call the facts. So every court case has two sets of facts, two kinds of facts. We have procedural facts and we have substantive facts, okay? So when you're doing this section, you want to break it down into these separate things. You wanna first identify what the procedural facts are and then identify the substantive facts, or you can do it the other order. First identify the substantive facts and then identify the procedural facts. So let's talk about what each of these are. So procedural facts are what happened in the lower courts. So when you're looking at or reading the court cases, you're going to figure out, okay, first it went to this court and then that court decided this and then it went to the next court, it went to the appellate court and then it went to the next highest court, Court of Appeals in New York. What is the way that it went through the court system? And when you're reading the decision, it should kind of lay that out pretty clearly for you. So let's look at an example. Okay, John Smith was subject to a search that wasn't supported by probable cause and he was convicted in federal district court based on evidence obtained in that search. He appealed his conviction to the US Court of Appeals which remanded his case back to the district court to determine if the search required probable cause. The district court decided the search did not require probable cause. This case was again appealed to the US Court of Appeals which reversed the district court's decision the U.S. Supreme Court granted certiorari and reversed the U.S. Court of Appeals decision. Now it's crazy. Woo, 
what's going on in there. So all you have to do is start at the top and move step, step by step through to figure out exactly how um, it worked through the court. So the first thing we start with is we start that he was conv convicted in district court. So our first procedural fact will be convicted in district court. Then where did it go after that? Well, he was convicted, so he appealed it to the U.S. Court of Appeals. So our second procedural fact is he was convicted, then he went to the U.S. Court of Appeals. What did they do? They remanded it back. So it went district court, court of appeals, then back to the district court to make another determination. Once the, the district court made that determination, they decided it did not require probable cause at the district court. So where did it go? It now went to the U.S. Court of Appeals again. OK, they reversed that decision. And then the last thing was it went to the Supreme Court. So you can map out each court that made a decision in this case. Those are procedural facts. OK. Now we also have substantive facts. Substantive facts are what happened to the party before the litigation began. OK, so this is the who, what, where, when, how. So Mrs. Wicca woke up this morning. She ate breakfast. She worked on the computer. She answered emails. She ate lunch. She made a video. Those are your substantive facts. What did you do? What led up to it? Where, when, how? All of those things are your substantive facts. So every case is based on facts. That's why I love the law. It's always a story. So what is the story? What happened to the characters? Why are they involved in the legal system? Those are your substantive facts, okay? So now let's go back to Roshan. So read through Roshan and see if you can identify what are the procedural facts and what are the substantive facts, okay? So you can pause the video and try to list them out and see if you uh, can get them right and then list out your procedural facts and then start your video again when you're all done. So hopefully you located the substantive facts and you listed out the substantive facts, okay? So what do we know happened? Uh, deputies arrived and they thought that Roshan is selling narcotics. They enter his home and force themselves into his bedroom. They see him on the bed and they see two capsules sitting next to him. They grab the capsules and swallow them. He grabs the capsules and swallow them. They take them to the hospital. They force them to regurgitate or vomit them. And they discover that they're morphine. And then he's arrested and charged. Okay, so those are your substantive facts. What happened to Roshan? How did Roshan get involved in this process in the first place? Okay. Next, you have procedural facts. What court heard this case? Well, he uh, he challenged the search that took him to court in the first place. He went to trial and he was convicted and he appealed. So then it went to the District uh, Court of Appeals, which affirmed the conviction. And then it went to the highest court in California, which was the California Supreme Court. And then eventually went to the highest court, US Supreme Court. Okay, so those are the substantive and procedural facts that existed within our case. Now, the next issue is the rule or law that's being discussed. What is the rule or law that's being discussed in the situation? So this one's pretty easy. 99% of the time, it's going to be a constitutional amendment. What is the actual law that they're trying to resolve? So you'd have to think about the Constitution and think about what amendment is being discussed in this case, okay? So most of the time, it's going to be a Supreme Court or a constitutional amendment. So when we read the court case, we have to think about what law or what constitutional provision is the Supreme Court trying to figure out? What is it they what is it that they're interpreting? Okay. So when we look at our case, Roshan, what is he claiming that the police did wrong? Well, 
he's claiming that they came in and searched him illegally. So then we have to know what constitutional amendment is that dealing with? And it will say it in the opinion. So in our case, the rule or the law that's being discussed is the due process clause of the 14th amendment. Okay, so it's the Fourth Amendment for search and seizure, and it's the due process clause that they violated his due process rights. Sorry, I said the Fourth Amendment search and seizure. It is because he's, they're saying that he's saying the search was wrong, but actually what he's saying is by making him regurgitate the pills, that was a violation of his due process rights. So really, this case is not dealing with whether they should have went in and searched in the first place. I'm sorry, I got confused. This case is actually dealing with when they forced him to regurgitate the pills, did that violate any of his rights? And he's claiming it violated his 14th Amendment due process. He was not given fair process before they made him do that. Okay, so sorry. Okay, so then the next issue is what is the constitutional question that's being asked? Okay. So the constitutional question that Roshan is asking the Supreme Court is about whether or not it was fair that they made him regurgitate those pills. Now, when we're talking about the constitutional question, the issue, issue presented, sometimes they call it that, then you're talking about a question and we write that question in a certain format. What we're going to do is we're always going to um, try to decide um, what constitutional amendment are they talking about and what are the facts specific to this case that the Supreme Court is trying to figure out. So what we're going to do is use a specific format to do that. So we're going to always start with the word whether. So when we're writing our constitutional question or issue, we're going to just start writing the word whether. After we write the word whether, we're going to next follow it by the rule that we or the law that we wrote above. So we said in this case, it was the 14th Amendment. So you're going to write whether the 14th Amendment was violated. And then you follow it with the facts of the case. So if I am claiming that I was arrested for swearing in class, and I think it violates my free speech, my issue or weather statement, I'm gonna start with the word, I'm gonna write the word weather. And then what amendment am I saying was violated? My first amendment rights were violated. So whether the first amendment was violated when, and now I'm gonna go back up to my substantive facts and look, what did I write? What did the police do that violated my first amendment rights? Well, they violated when they arrested me for swearing in class. So when you write it out, whether the first amendment was violated when I was arrested for swearing in class. So you have the information you need to write this statement. You start with the word whether, then you look up to your rule or your um, law, and write that whether the First Amendment was violated when, and then you go back up to your substantive facts and write what the police did when they arrested me for swearing in class. So you have all the information, you're just putting it together in a question format for the question presented. Okay, so let's try a couple of these scenarios. So John is claiming that the police illegally searched him and seized his wallet when they grabbed him as he walked down the street. So search and seizure, we haven't learned yet, but is going to be the Fourth Amendment. So we're going to have to write it in our format. So see if you can write it. Start with the word weather. What's the constitutional rule or law that we're talking about? And what did the police do? The next one, Carrie claims that it was cruel and unusual punishment for her to receive the death penalty for stealing a piece of gum. So we haven't learned it yet, but that's going to be an Eighth Amendment violation. So we start with the word weather, write the word weather, then write the law that we're talking about. And then what did the police or what did the courts do to her? Okay. So hopefully when you do that, this is what you got. 
whether the Fourth Amendment was violated when police searched and seized John while he was just walking down the street. Second one, whether the Eighth Amendment was violated when Carrie received the death penalty for stealing a piece of gum. Okay, so those are how you would write it. So now think about the Roshan case. How would we write that? So whether, then go back to what we wrote for the rule or law, 14th Amendment due process clause was violated when, and then go back to your substantive facts, what did the police do? When they arrest, they made him regurgitate his pills. So hopefully when you write it out, whether the due process clause of the 14th Amendment was violated when police forced the defendant to regurgitate the capsules at the hospital. That's your issue or question presented. Okay. If you're struggling with this a little, don't panic. This is probably the hardest part. But if you have any questions, just reach out, talk to me, and I can help you work on this. Okay. So the next section is what are the arguments on both sides? So think about arguing with your mom, okay? Your brother, I'm sorry, I think about arguing with your brother or sister or cousin or friend, right? She did this to me. No, she didn't do it to me. What are the arguments on both sides? That's what this is, okay? So you and your brother are fighting, you run to your mom. He punched me in the arm and then he runs to your mom and says, I didn't punch her in the arm. She turned my TV off that I was watching. <clears throat> so what are the arguments on both sides? She's saying he punched her. He's saying she turned the TV off. That's what we mean by arguments on both sides. Now, when we're thinking of it in terms of a court case, in a criminal case, you're talking about the state, what the state is saying. So the state is saying this person did something criminally wrong and that they you know, should be able to use the evidence or whatever. And the defense is saying, no, 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 the police did something wrong. You shouldn't be able to use the evidence. So in this part, you are going to tell me what are both sides arguing, okay? So the state's gonna always say, oh, we did everything right. The police did everything right. This person's a bad criminal and we should be able to use the evidence to convict them. And the defense is always gonna say, no, 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 the police are wrong. They violated constitutional rights. You have to let the defendant go. So you need to just be more specific and tell me exactly what each side is arguing. So in our case, if you think about it, think back, what are the prosecutors saying, okay? So remember, we're talking about regurgitating the pills. So what are the prosecutors saying about forcing Roshan to vomit the pills? Well, they're saying it was okay, right? That to force him was okay. It wasn't shocking, it wasn't bad, it didn't do anything wrong, it didn't violate the 14th Amendment, okay? That's what the prosecutor is saying. So therefore, they can use the evidence against him and convict him. So now we have to switch hats. If we're Roshan's attorney, what are they arguing in the court case? When you read the court case, what are they saying? Okay. Well, they are saying, no, 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 it was bad. You can't do it. It violated the 14th Amendment. It wasn't decent. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. Since it was unfair, it was shocking then therefore it violates due process and it wasn't right. So you can't use it, okay? And so therefore you cannot use that evidence against the defendant, okay? So that is the arguments on both sides. Now, the next issue we have to decide is what did the court actually decide in this case? So we go back up and we look at our issue presented, okay? Or our question presented, whether the 14th Amendment was violated when they made him regurgitate the pills. So for the holding or court decision, how did the court answer that question? So for this, all it is is a quick answer. It's not long. You're not giving me the explanations yet. You're just quickly telling me how the court answered that question. 
So whether the 14th Amendment was violated when the defendant was forced to regurgitate the pills, how did the court answer that question in this case? Was it a violation of the 14th Amendment or wasn't it a violation of the 14th Amendment? Okay, so it's pretty easy. You just reverse the question presented in an answer. So what our previous issues, we said whether the Fourth Amendment was violated when police searched and seized John while he was walking down the street, or whether the Eighth Amendment was violated when Carrie received the death penalty for stealing a piece of gum. Okay, so let's take our first one. We read the court case and the police say, yes, the police did violate his rights. So how do we write this? We just turn it down round into an affirmative statement. So instead of being a question, we write the answer. The second one, what did the court say about the death penalty for stealing gum? Yes, that does violate the Eighth Amendment. So now we just have to write it as a statement, a conclusion. So think about how you could write those as conclusions. You can just take the words and reword it. So it's not a question anymore, it's an answer. So try to do that for a second. You can stop the video and see if you have it, and then I'll give you the answer. So the first one, the Supreme Court held that the Fourth Amendment was violated when they searched and seized John for walking down the street. Just took it, turned it into an answer. Second one, Supreme Court held the Eighth Amendment was not violated when Kerry received the death penalty, okay, or was doesn't, you know, whatever the court said. So you just take what you wrote and you switch it around to an answer. Okay, so for Roshan, what, when you read the court case, what did the Supreme Court say about it violating the 14th Amendment when they forced him to regurgitate the pills? So you have to read it and you have to figure out what the court actually said. So see if you can figure that out, stop this, and then we'll look at the example. So the court in this case said the Supreme Court said that the 14th Amendment was violated when the police forced Roshan to regurgitate the capsules at the hospital. So our court decision is just taking our issue and then giving what the court gave for that answer. Now the next section is where you tell me why. Why did the court say that, okay? What were the reasons the court gave? So for the decision, you're just restating it exactly. It's only one sentence. The court reasoning is where you give me the reasons why. Why did the court say that? Sometimes they'll reference other court cases. They'll say, oh, well, we decided it this way because other court cases said certain things. So sometimes when you're reading it, you'll see other court cases listed in there. They're relying on that, that's precedent. They're using precedent to, um, re to make the decision in that ca this case. And that is your key word for this week's lecture. So your key word for this week's lecture is the word precedent, P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T, precedent. So make sure you write it down, precedent, and you send it to me in an email for attending this lecture, okay? So court reasoning, they say why they made that decision, okay? So just explain in your own words, do not cut and paste, do not just put it, it will show up on my grade is that you plagiarized. So please don't do it, you have to read it and put it in your own words. This is hard, sometimes this is the hardest part. If you're confused on the court's reasoning, contact me, ask me, you and I can talk. We'll work it out, we'll rationalize it together. But tell me in your own words why the court reached that decision, okay? In our example, when you read Roshan, why did the court say it violated his 14th Amendment? So try to figure that out. Now, what I said it was their reasoning was the court said that when they looked at due process, they have to con consider law and society. What does the society view as acceptable for police behavior? Is it acceptable to force a person to regurgitate or vomit? The court said, no, 
That is not acceptable under today's society's changing society, the way the law is. It would not be acceptable to force somebody to regurgitate pills. It is shocking. Okay, so what the court said is we look and determine if what the police did was shocking. And in this case, we think that forcing a person to vomit is shocking, right? It's bad. It could cause their stomach to perforate and they bleed to death. They could die. Basically, that's what the court's saying. So when you look at what the police did, if you decide it's shocking, then it violates the 14th Amendment. We're going to use this case way at the end of the semester, but you're going to see that this is going to come back up. Since it was bad, we can't do it. And they reversed the decision and sent his case back down. Okay, so the case was reversed. So that is our reasoning. Now, this section comes up. We're not going to include this this year in our actual projects. But I just want you to know what they are. So the majority of judges all vote. There's nine judges. They all vote. Okay. And the, whatever the majority is, that becomes law. So the majority of judges, whatever they decide, becomes the majority opinion. Okay. Now, sometimes judges don't agree. So you don't have nine, all nine agreeing on the same case. So sometimes they write concurrence and dissent. So concurrence means they agree on the ultimate outcome of the case, but their reasoning for it is different than the majority. So although they may agree with the majority's final decision, they get to it through a different reason. Okay. Sometimes you have dissents. Dissent is when they completely disagree with the majority. They don't agree with the law that the majority set forth. So when you're reading court cases, you'll see sometimes it will say concurrence. Remember, they agree, but for a different reason, and they're going to want to explain to you what their reasons are. And then you may see dissent, and a dissent means they disagree. We're not going to worry about that so much this year. Okay, so if you're just looking at this to try to figure out what they are, read each statement and decide, is it a concurrence or is it a dissent? So stop the video and see what you think. So the first one, Judge Smith disagreed with the majority of the court stating he did not believe that the First Amendment was protected, uh, protected screaming fire in an airport. So that is a dissent. He disagrees with the majority. The second one, Judge Judy agrees with the majority of the court that the people can scream fire in an airport, but does not believe the First Amendment protects this. It's the 14th Amendment. So this is a concurrence agrees with the ultimate outcome before a different amendment, okay? The last section you're going to include is what we call the critical assessment or the assessment or critical analysis. This isn't going to include two parts. You need to think about your court case and think about what impact, how is this case going to affect the entire criminal justice system, okay? So this is big picture. When you read this court case, what effect does this case have on the whole system? And then the last part is, what do you think about it? How do you think about this case? Do you like it? Do you disagree? You don't always have to agree with what judges say. You can formulate your own opinion. And I want to know what that opinion is. Just make sure that you justify your opinion. You tell me why you feel the way that you do about your about this case. So you can agree or you can disagree, but the biggest thing is explaining why. Why do you feel the way that you feel? Okay? So in our example, the criticism could be, I agree with Roshan, I think it's horrible, I disagree with Roshan, you know, whatever you think is the it is. And how do you think it affects the system? Well, it may affect the system because we can never take somebody and have them regurgitate pills anymore. That's not a method we can use to get evidence. Okay, so that has a big impact on the criminal justice system. Now, to finish up, just a couple facts. Make sure you read the entire case first. Make a quick brief. Figure out what you wanted to say. Create your own style. Write on it make cross references, you know, mark it up, make sure you really understand, make sure you paraphrase things in your own words, you're not cutting and pasting. 
And if you don't understand a word, ask me or look it up because these are legal terms. You're going to run into things you don't understand. Look them up, ask me, and if you don't understand and keep working through it, okay? I posted a sample brief online that you can look at. So I will show you that. I also posted a lot of reference materials for you to use. I'll show you those also. And then the last thing you're gonna do is you're going to work on your first project, briefing a case. You're going to make an infographic of a court case and you're going to share it with the class. So we're gonna use some major cases, what we call landmark cases throughout the year. Each of you are going to be assigned a landmark case. You're gonna brief it, and then you're gonna make a quick infographic to share with the class so that the class can use that as a reference throughout the semester for homework and different things like that. So make sure you check out your project requirements. Um, I'm gonna just point out a couple things really quick that you can use. So one of the things that I posted, everything I just said, I put in a Word document and explain it all the way through. So this is posted and it goes through each section, what it is and how you do each section. So everything I just went over, there's a quick reference worksheet that you can use, it's posted. The other thing that I posted is a worksheet that goes with it, okay? So this is just a helpful worksheet when you're reading your your case, you can jot down notes on here and ha help you figure out what each section of your case says. So those two things are posted and they're just references for you, okay? So you can quickly look at those and um, use them to help uh, brief your case. So don't forget they're out there and uh, you're able to use those. Uh, the last thing I wanna show you is the project requirements. So this is posted under projects. Um, you can read it. You are going to create an infographic, which is just a quick visual presentation of information. So you can read this, all of the requirements for it, okay? It tells you the sections that are gonna go in it, what needs to be included. What you're gonna do is create that. You're gonna attach it to the assignment tab so I can grade it. Then you're going to share it with the discussion tab and share it with the class. And this discussion is going to stay up all year. It's going to be referenced for people to use throughout the semester. Okay. So some of you are probably like, what the heck's an infographic? I have posted a sample one online under the discussion for one of the first cases we're going to learn. So you can use it as a reference. Okay. So this is my infographic. Here's my court case, my citation, and then each of the sections really quick. It's brief. So just a couple sentences explaining each section. It's visual, it has pictures, and it's just a quick way for people to create a reference for their court cases. Now, I used a, I used a program called Pictogram. Um, if you just Google free infographic, uh, programs, just find a free one and you can use it. I just literally created this one night in an hour um, quickly. I just figured out the program, cut and pasted some media pictures in there. Um, if you need any help, reach out. I can Zoom with you. I can show you what I did. Uh, you can use any program you want, um, but this will be what you create. I created it in the program and then it let me download it as a PDF. Then I saved it and posted it to the discussion tab. So you can look at that anytime you want. It's under the discussions. Okay, so that's it. That's the end of briefing a case. This is a hard thing. It's a hard skill. If you were confused at all, please, please reach out, email me, text me, call me. We can Zoom. I can explain in more detail. Um, if you want to read your case, so you're gonna look at a list of cases. You're gonna pick one of them, email me your top three choices. I'll email you back which case, and then you're gonna read your case. So no two students have the same case. When you read it, if you're confused at all, call me. You and I will talk about it. We'll go over it before you spend a lot of time briefing and um, creating your infogram or infographic, just call me and let's talk about it if you're confused at all or you need any help on your case. 
This is not meant to be hours and hours and hours of work. So if you're starting to feel yourself spending a lot of time on this, reach out to me and I can probably simplify it for you. Okay. Well, I hope this helped explain. I hope you have an understanding and I'm always here to help you. Okay, that finishes chapter one and next week we'll move on to chapter two. Bye.